Chapter 12 Death on the Moor For a moment or two I sat breathless, hardly able to believe my ears. Then my senses and my voice came back to me, while a crushing weight of responsibility seemed in an instant to be lifted from my soul. That cold, incisive, ironical voice could belong to no one man in all the world. Holmes, I cried, Holmes. Come out, he said, and please be careful with your revolver. I stooped under the rude lintel, and there he sat upon a stone outside, his gray eyes dancing with amusement as they fell upon my astonished features. He was thin and worn, but clear and alert, his keen face bronzed by the sun and roughened by the wind. In his tweed suit and cloth cap he looked like any other tourist upon the moor, and he had personally contrived, with that cat-like love of personal cleanliness with which one of his characteristics, that his chin should be as smooth as as his linen is perfect as if he were in Baker Street. I never was more glad to see anyone in my life, said I, and I wrung him by the hand. Oh, I'm more astonished, eh? Well, I must confess to it. The surprise was not all on one side, I assure you. I had no idea that you had found my occasional retreat, still less that you were inside it, until I was within twenty paces of the door. By footprint, I presume? No, Watson. I fear that I could not undertake to recognize your footprint amid all the footprints of the world. If you seriously desire to deceive me, you must change your tobaccoists. For when I see the stub of a cigarette marked Brad Bradley, Oxford Street, I know that my friend Watson is in the neighborhood. You will see it there beside the path. You threw it down, no doubt, at that supreme moment when you charged into the empty hut. Exactly. I thought as much. And knowing your admiral tenacity, I was convinced that you were sitting in ambush, a weapon within reach, waiting for the tenant to return. So you actually thought that I was the criminal. I did not know who you were, but I was determined to find out. Excellent, Watson. And how did you localize me? You saw me, perhaps, on the night of the convict hunt, when I was so imprudent to allow my the moon to rise behind me? Yes, I saw you then. And have, no doubt, searched all the huts until you came to this one. No, your boy had been observed, and I gave me a guide where to look. The old gentleman with a telescope, no doubt. I could not make it out when I first I saw the light flashing upon the lens. He rose and peeped into the hut. Ha! Ah, I see that Cartwright was brought up some supplies. What's this paper? So you have been to Coombe Tracy, have you? Yes. To see Miss Laura Lyons. Exactly. Well done. Our researchers have been evidently been put running on parallel lines, and when we unite, we unite our results, I expect we shall have a fairly full knowledge of the case. Well, I am glad from my heart that you are here, for indeed the responsibility and the mystery are both becoming too much for my nerves. But how in the name of wonder did you come here? And what have you been doing? I thought that you were in Baker Street, working off that case of blackmailing. That was as I wished you to think. And then you, you, then you used me, and yet you do not trust me. I cried with some bitterness. I think I have deserved better than your hands, Holmes. My dear fellow, you have been invaluable to me in this and as many other cases. 
and I beg that you will forgive me if I have seemed to play a trick upon you. In truth, it was partly for your own sake that I did it, and it was my appreciation of the danger which you ran which led me to come down and examine matters for myself. Had I been with Sir Henry and you, it is evident, that my point of view would have been the same as yours, and my presence would have warned our very formidable opponents to be on guard. As it is, I have been able to get about, as I could not possibly have done, had I been living in the hall, and I remain an unknown factor in the business, ready to throw in all my weight at the critical moment. But why keep me in the dark? For you to know could have not helped me, else, and possibly led to my discovery. You would have wished to tell me something, or in your kindness you would have brought me out here, some comfort or other, and in, and it's so an unnecessary risk would be run. I brought Cartwright down with me, you remember the little chap from the express office, and he has seen after my simple wants, a loaf of bread and a clean collar. What does man want more? He has given me an extra pair of eyes upon the very active pair of feet, and both have been invaluable. Then my reports have all been wasted. My voice trembled as I recalled the pains and the pride with which I had composed them. Holmes took a bundle of papers from his pocket. Here are your reports, my dear fellow. I'm very well thumbed, I assure you. I made excellent arrangements, and they are all one delayed one day upon their way. I must compliment you exceedingly upon the zeal and the intelligence which you have shown over the extraordinarily difficult case. I was still rather raw over the deception which had been practiced upon me, but the warmth of Holmes's praise drove my anger from my mind. I felt also in my heart that he was right in what he said and that it was really best for our report, for our purpose, that I should not have known that he was upon the moor. That's better, said he, seeing the shadow rise from my face. And now tell me the result of your visit to Miss Laura Lyons. It was not difficult for me to guess that it was to see her that you had gone, for I am already aware that she is the one person in Cumbre Tracy who might be of service to this matter. In fact, if you had not gone today, it is exceedingly probable that I should have gone tomorrow. The sun had set, and the dusk was settling over the moor. The air had turned chill, and we withdrew into the war hut for warmth. There, sitting together in the twilight, I told Holmes of my conversation with the lady. So interested was he that I had to repeat some of it twice before he was satisfied. This is most important, said he, when I concluded. It fills up a gap which I have been unable to bridge in this most complex affair. You are aware, perhaps, that a close intimacy exists between this lady and the man Stapleton? I do not know of a close int intimacy. There can be no doubt of the matter. They meet, they write, there is a complete understanding between them. Now this puts a very powerful weapon into our hands. If I could only use it to detach his wife. His wife? I'm giving you some information now, in return for all that you've given me. The lady who has passed here as Miss Stapleton is, in reality, his wife. Good heaven, Holmes! Are you sure of what you say? How could you have permitted Sir Henry to fall in love with her? Sir Henry's falling in love could do no more harm than anyone except Sir Henry. He took particular care that Sir Henry did not make love to her, and you have yourself observed. I repeat that the lady is his wife, and not his sister. Why the elaborate deception? Because he foresaw that she would be very much more useful to him in the character of a free woman. Oh, 
all my unspoken instincts, my vague suspicions suddenly took shape and centered upon the naturalist. And what passive curves man with his straw hat and his butterfly net? I seemed to see something terrible, a creature of infinite patience, craft, with a smiling face and a murderous heart. It is he, then, who is our enemy. It is he who doctors in London. So I read the riddle. And the warning, it must have come from her. Exactly. The shape of some monstrous villainy, half seen, half guessed, loomed through the darkness which had girt me so long. But are you sure of this, Holmes? How do you know that the woman is his wife? Because he so far forgot himself as to tell you the true piece of autobiography upon the occasion when he first met you, and I dare say he has many times regretted it since. He was once a schoolmaster in the north of England. Now there is no one more easy to trace than a schoolmaster. There are scholastic agencies by which one may identify any man who has been in the profession. A little investigation showed me that the school had come to grief under atrocious circumstances, and that the man who had owned it, the name was different, was disappeared with his wife. The descriptions agreed. When I learned that the missing man was devoted to entomology, the identification was complete. Darkness was rising and much was still hidden by the shadows. If this woman is in truth his wife, where does Miss Laura Lyons come in, I asked. That is one of the points upon which your own researches have shed a light. Your interview with the lady has cleared the situation very much. I did not know about a projected divorce between herself and her husband. In that case, regarding Stapleton as an unmarried man, she counted no doubt upon becoming his wife. And when she is deceived? Why, then, she may find the lady of service. It must be our first duty to see her, both of us, tomorrow. Don't you think, Watson, that you are away from your charge rather long? Your place should be at Baskerville Hall. Red streaks had faded away in the west, and the night had settled upon them. A few faint stars were gleaming in a violet sky. One last question, Holmes, I said as I rose. Surely there is no need for secrecy between you and me. What is the meaning of it all? What is he after? Holmes's voice sank as he answered. It is murder, Watson. Refined, cold-blooded, deliberate murder. Do not ask me the particulars. The nets are closing upon him. Even as we are upon Sir Henry. And with your help, he is already almost at my mercy. There is but one danger which we can threaten us. It is that he should strike before we are ready to do so. Another day, two at the most, and I will have this case complete. And until then, guard your charge as closely as ever a fond mother watched an ailing child. And yet, your mission today has justified itself. And yet, I could almost wash that you had not left his side. Hark! A terrible scream. A prolonged yell of horror and anguish burst out of the silence of the moor. That frightful cry turned the blood to ice in my veins. Oh my god, I gasped. What is it? What does it mean? Holmes had sprung to his feet, and I saw his dark, athletic outline at the door of the top. His shoulders stooping, his head thrust forward, his face peering into the darkness. Hush, he whispered. Hush. 
The cry had been loud on account of its vehemence, but it had peeled away from somewhere far off in the shadowy plain. Now it burst upon our ears, nearer, louder, and more urgent than before. Where is it? Holmes whispered, and I knew from the thrill of his voice that he, the man of iron, was shaken to the soul. Where is it, Watson? There, I think. I pointed at the darkness. No, there. Again the agonized cry swept through the silent night, louder and much nearer than ever, and a new sound mingled with it, a deep, muttered rumble, musical and yet menacing, rising and falling like the low, constant murmur of the sea. <coughs> The hound, cried Holmes. Come, Watson, come. Great heavens, if we are too late. It started running swiftly over the moor, and I had followed at his heels. But out of somewhere among the broken ground immediately in front of us, there came one last desperate yell, and then a dull, heavy thud. We halted and listened. Not another sound broke the heavy silence of the windless night. He has beaten us, Watson. We're too late. No, surely not. Fool that I was to hold my hand. And you, Watson, see what comes of abandoning your charge. But, by heaven, if the worst has happened, we will avenge him. Blindly we ran through the gloom, blundering against boulders, forcing our way through the gorse brushes, panting up hills and rushing down slopes heading away in the direction whence the dreadful sounds had come. At every rise, Holmes looked eagerly around him, but the shadows were thick upon the moor, and nothing moved upon its dreary face. <clears throat> Can you see nothing? Nothing! But hark, what is this? The low moan had fallen upon our ears. There it was again upon our left. Oh, that side of the ridge of rocks ended with a sheer cliff that overlooked the stone-strewn slope. On the jagged face was spread eagled some dark irregular object. As we ran towards it, the vague outline hardened into a definite shape. It was a prostrate man, face down upon the ground. His head doubled under him in a horrible angle. The shoulders rounded and the body hunched together as if in an act of throwing a somersault. So grotesque was the attitude that I could not for an instant realize that the man, had, the moan had been passing from his soul. Not a whisper, not a rustle, rose now from the dark figure over which we stooped. Holmes laid his hand upon him and held it up against sense with an exclamation of horror. The gleam of the match which struck the shone upon the cluttered fingers and upon the ghastly pool which widened slowly from the crushed skull of the victim. And it shone upon something else which turned our hearts sick and faint within us. The body of Sir Henry Baskerville. There was no chance of either of us forgetting that particularly ruddy tweed suit, the very one which he had worn on the first morning that he had seen him in Baker Street. He caught the one gl clear glimpse of it, and then the match flickered and went out, even as the hope had gone out of our souls. Holmes groaned, and his face glimmered white in the darkness. The brute! The brute! he cried. It's a clinch hands. Oh, Holmes, I shall never forgive myself for having left him at fate. I am more to blame than you, Watson. In order to have a case well-rounded and complete, I have thrown away the life of my client. It is the greatest blow which has befallen me in my career. But how could I know? How could I know? that he would risk his own life along the moor in the face of all my warnings. 
that we should have heard his screams. My God, those screams! And yet have been able to save him. Where is this battle of hound which drove him to death? It may be lurking among these rocks at the instant. And Stapleton, where is he? He shall answer for this deed. He shall. How is it that? Uncle and nephew have been murdered. The one frightened to death in the very sight of the beast which he thought was to be supernatural, the other driven to his end in his flights from the wild escape from it. But now we have to prove the connection between the man and the beast. Save from what we have heard, we cannot even swear to the existence of the latter, since Sir Henry has evidently died from the fall. But by heavens, cunning as he is, the fellow shall be in my power before another day is past. We stood with bitter hearts on either side of the mangled body, overwhelmed by his sudden and irrevocable disaster which had brought all our long and weary labors to its piteous end. Then, as the moon rose, we climbed to the top of the rocks which our poor friend had fallen, and from the summit we set out over the shady moor, half silver and half gloom. Far away, miles off in the direction of Gimpen, a single steady light was shining. It could only be coming from the abode of the lonely simpletons. Stapletons. With a bitter curse, I shook my fist at it as I gazed. Why should we not seize him at once? Our case is not complete. The fellow was wary and cunning to the last degree. It is not that what we know, but what we can prove. If we cannot, we can, if we make a false move, the villain may escape us yet. What can we do? There will be plenty for us to do tomorrow. Tonight we can only perform the last offices to our poor friend. Together we made our way down the precipice slope and approached the body, black and clear against the silver tones. The agony of these contorted limbs struck me with a spasm of pain and blurred my eyes with tears. We must send for help, Holmes. We cannot carry him all the way to the hole. Good heavens, are you mad? He had uttered a cry and bent over the body. Now he was dancing and laughing and wringing my hand. Could this be my stern, self-contained friend? These were hidden fires indeed. A beard! A beard! The man has a beard! A beard? It is not the baronet. It is. Why, it is his neighbor, the convict. With feverish haste, we had turned the body over, and that stripping beard was pointing up to the cloud to clear moon. There could be no doubt about the beetling forehead and the sunken animal eyes. It was indeed the same face which had glared upon me the night of the candle over the rock. The face of Selden, the criminal. Then in an instant it was all clear to me. I remembered how the baronet had told me that he had handled his old wardrobe to Barrymore. Barrymore had passed it over to the Selwyn in his escape. Boots, cap, shirt, it was all Sir Henry's. The man, tra his tragedy was still black enough. This man had at least deserved death by the, all the laws of his country. I told Holmes how the matter stood, my heart bubbling over with thankfulness and joy. Then the clothes have been a poor fellow's death, said he. It is clear enough that the hound has been laid on some article of Sir Henry's. The boot which was abstracted by the hotel in all probability, and so ran this man down. There is one very singular thing, however. How came Selden in the darkness to know that the hound was on his trail?
He heard him. To hear a hound upon the moor would not work a hard man like his convict into such a patriarchy of, of terror that he would risk recapture by screaming wildly for help. By his cries he must have run a long way after he knew the animal was on his track. How did he know? The question, Mr. Smee, is why this hound, presuming that all our conjectures are correct? I presume nothing. Well, then, why this hound should be loose tonight? I suppose it does not always run loose on the moor. Stapleton would not let it go unless he had reason to think that Sir Henry would be here. My difficulty is that the more formidable of the two, for I think that we shall very shortly get an explanation of yours, while mine may remain a mystery forever. The question is now, what shall we do with this poor wretch's body? We cannot leave it here for the foxes and the ravens. I suggest that we put it in one of the huts until we can communicate with the police. Exactly. I have no doubt that you would, and I can carry it so far. Hello, Watson, what's this? It's the man himself, by all the wonderful and audacious. Not a word to show your suspicions, not a word, or my plans crumble to the ground. The figure was approaching us over the moor, and I saw the dull glow, red glow of a cigar. The moon shone upon him. I could distinguish the dapper shape and jaunty walk of the naturalists. He stopped when he saw us, and then came on again. My Dr. Watson, that's you. It's not. You're the last man I should have expected to stay out here on the moor at this time of night. But, dear me, what's this? Somebody hurt? No, don't tell me that it was our friend Sir Henry. He hurried past me and stooped over the dead body. I heard a sharp intake of his breath, and the cigar fell from his fingers. Who? Who's this? he stammered. It is Selden, the man who escaped from Princeton. Stapleton turned a ghastly face upon us, but by a supreme effort he had overcome his amazement and his disappointment. He looked sharply from Holmes to me. Dear me, what is a very shocking affair? How did he die? He appears to have broken his neck by falling over these rocks. My friend and I were strolling on the moor when we heard a cry. I heard a cry also. That was what brought me out. I was uneasy about Sir Henry. Why about Sir Henry in particular? I could not help asking. Because I had suggested that he should come over, and when he did not come, I was surprised, and I naturally became alarmed for safety as I heard cries upon the moor. But, by the way, his eyes darted again from my face to Holmes's. Did you hear anything else besides the cry? No, said Holmes. But you? No. What do you mean then? Oh, you know about the stories of the peasants, about the phantom hound, and so on. It was said to the herds at nights upon the moor, so I was wondering if there were any evidence of such a sound tonight. We heard nothing of the kind, said I. And what is your theory about this poor fellow's death? I have no doubt that anxiety and exposure have driven him off his head. He has rushed about the moor like a crazy state, but evidently fallen over here and broken his neck. That seems the most reasonable theory, said Stapleton, and he gave a sigh which I took to indicate his relief. What do you think about it, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? My friend bowed his confidence. You are quick at indication. 
said he. I've been expecting you to come down to these parts since Dr. Watson came down. You're in time to see a tragedy. Yes, indeed. I have no doubt that my friend's explanation will cover your facts. I will be taking an unpleasant remembrance back to London with me tomorrow. Oh, you return tomorrow? That is my intention. I hope that your visit has cast some light upon the occurrences which you have puzzled about. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. One cannot always have the success for which one hopes. An investigator needs facts, not legends or rumors. That has not been a satisfactory case. Our friend spoke in his frankest, most unconcerned manner. Stapleton still looked hard at him. Then he turned to me. I would suggest carrying this poor fellow to my house, but it would give my sister such a fright that I do not feel it justified in doing it. I think that if we put something over his face, he will be safe until morning. And so it was arranged. Resisting Stapleton's offer for hospitality, Holmes then set off for Baskerville Hall, leaving the naturalists to return to them. Looking back, we saw the figure moving slowly away from the Broadmoor, and behind him, that one black smudge on the silvered slope which showed where the man was lying, who had come so horribly to his death. We're at close grips at last, said Holmes, as we walked together across the moor. What a nerve that fellow has! How he has pulled himself together in the face of what must have been a paralyzing shock when he had found the wrong man had fallen victim to his plot. I told you in London, Watson, and I tell you again now that we have never had a foeman more worthy of our steel. I'm sorry that he has seen you. And so was I at first. But there was no getting out of it. What effect do you think it will have upon his plans now that he knows you are here? It may cause him to be more cautious, or it may drive him to desperate measures at once. Like most clever criminals, he may be too confident in his own cleverness and imagine that he has completely deceived us. Why should we not arrest him at once? My dear Watson, were you born to be a man of action? Your instinct is always to do something energetic. But supposing, for argument's sake, that we had him arrested tonight... What on earth the better off should we be for it? We could prove nothing against him. There's a devilish cunning of it. If he were acting through a human agent, we could get some evidence. But if we have to drag this great dog to the light of day, he would not help us in the matter of putting a rope around the neck of its master. Surely we have a case. Not a shadow of only surmising conjecture. We should be laughed out of court if we came with such a story and such evidence. There is Sir Charles's death. Found dead without a mark upon him. You and I know that he died of sheer fright, and we also know what frightened him. But how are we to get twelve stolid journeymen to know it? What signs are there of the hound? Were there any marks or fangs? Of course. We know that a hound does not bite a dead body, and that Sir Charles was dead before and after the brute overtook him. But we have to prove this, and we are not in a position to do so. Oh, then, tonight? We are not much better off tonight. Again, there is no direct connection between the hound and the man's death. We never saw the hound. We heard it. But we could not prove that it was running upon this man's trail. There is a complete absence of motive. No, oh, my dear fellow, we must reconcile ourselves to the fact that we have no case at the presence, and that it is worth our while to run any risk in order to establish one. 
And how do you propose to establish one? I have great hopes that what Mrs. Laura Lyons may do for us when the position of affairs is made clear to her. And I have my own plan as well. Sufficient for tomorrow as the evil thereof. But I hope that before the day has passed to have an upper hand at last. I could draw nothing farther from him. And he walked, thus and thought, as far as the Baskerville gates. Are you coming up? Yes. I see no reason to further concealment. But one last word, Watson. Say nothing of the hound to Sir Henry. Let him think that Selden's death was as Stapleton would have us believe. He will have a better nerve for the ordeal which he will have to undergo tomorrow. When he is engaged, if I will remember your report right, to dine with these people. And so am I. Then you must excuse yourself, and he must go alone. That will be easily arranged. For now, if we are to wait for dinner... I think that we are both ready for our suppers.